Throughout history, children have often been utilized as nothing more than cheap and convenient labor, forced to undertake a whole host of unbelievable and downright dangerous jobs. In an age before legislation which protects the rights of workers and enforces a minimum working age, young children were often at the mercy of ruthless adults keen to exploit them for personal profit. So next time you think you're having a bad day at work, spare a thought for these unfortunate children. Number 5. Mudlarks Life in 18th and 19th century London was hard and unforgiving. For the huge numbers of children living in poverty, with no skills or opportunities to improve their situation, any chance to scrape together enough money to survive would be seized with both hands. For those children living near the River Thames, one way to generate an income was to become a mudlark. This lowly occupation involved scavenging through the muddy shores of the river, searching for anything of value which could be sold. The massive growth of London during the Industrial Revolution had resulted in enormous levels of waste and garbage being dumped into the River Thames. However, what was one man's trash would often be a child's treasure. As the tide of the river went out, packs of mudlarks would scurry through the mud, looking for anything that could earn them some coin. Chunks of coal, scraps of iron and pieces of wood that had been discarded by others would be gratefully gathered up by the mudlarks and sold for whatever they could get. On a rare lucky day, they might even find something more precious, such as a lost piece of jewellery or even silver coins. Yet such finds did not occur often, as the mudlarks had to compete with toshers, who were grown men who scavenged from the sewers. As the trash came through the sewage system first, the toshers would more often than not be the first to find the really valuable items. The work was backbreaking, the rewards were low, and the risk was high. The muddy riverbank was covered in raw sewage, and even the corpses of humans and animals. The mudlarks would often suffer deep cuts from shards of broken glass, and other pieces of rusting trash embedded in the shore, and such wounds were especially prone to infection, due to the filthy environment the children were surrounded by. Even a small wound could be a death sentence, and conditions were so bad that the term mudlark quickly became slang for a pig. The amount of money the mudlarks made each day was tiny, but it was enough for them to survive, and unlike most other jobs in that period, they had a certain amount of independence, being able to work whatever hours they chose and keeping 100% of the money they made. By the 20th century, improving opportunities in the cities meant that the occupation had all but disappeared, and the term instead began to be used to describe school children who would earn some extra money during the school holidays by begging passers-by to throw some spare change into the mud of the riverbank, which they would then scramble through the mud to retrieve, causing a spectacle which would amuse onlookers. Number 4. Mule Scavengers Yet another job born from the Industrial Revolution, mule scavengers were a common sight in textile mills across the world in the 18th and 19th centuries. Over the course of the working day, scraps of cotton would gather on the floor, underneath the great lumbering machines used to spin cotton into thread, along with dust, oil and other debris. These cotton scraps were seen by the mill owners as far too valuable to simply throw away, and needed to be collected and removed at regular intervals to prevent the machines clogging up and breaking down. The work was unskilled and required small bodies to fit underneath the spinning mules in order to get at the cotton scraps. Small children were seen as ideal for this task, being small enough to fit into the tight spaces and very cost effective. These scavengers were viewed as being at the bottom of the hierarchy of staff and had to endure the worst working conditions. The children were often orphans as young as four who were taken in by the factory owners and forced to work up to 16 hours a day until they were 15 years of age suffering severe beatings should they fall asleep from exhaustion. Trapped inside the dusty factories for most of the day, their fragile bodies frequently developed severe health problems, including respiratory diseases and even cancer. Yet these terrible health issues were not the only danger they faced. The giant spinning mules that spun cotton into thread would not be turned off to allow the child to scavenge the scraps underneath. The machine operators were paid by how much they produced, and as such, any lost time would prove too costly so they continued their work, forcing the children to crawl under the deadly spinning machines. To avoid having the life crushed out of them, the children had to lay low, desperately hugging the floor, as they carefully crawled underneath the enormous machines. As the mule moved forward, they had to quickly gather all the cotton scraps they could find, as carefully as they could, so as not to become entangled in the machine's moving parts. Despite taking such great care, accidents still happened. Hands and even heads would be frequently crushed under the machine's moving parts, and there were even reports of decapitations. Body parts were prone to being torn off, and perhaps the most feared injury was scalping. 
If the child's hair strayed too close to the machinery, it could be sucked in and become entangled, viciously tearing the scalp from the head. With such dangers looming overhead, the scavengers also suffered psychological breakdowns. Many were reported by observers to be in a constant state of grief and terror due to the constant noise in the factories and the ever-present danger of painful injury and death. Number 3. Coal Miners During Victorian times, steam became the prime source of energy, powering trains, factories and even ships. Burning coal was the best way to boil water and thus produce steam, causing an enormous increase in demand for the precious black chunks. Massive coal mines opened all over the world, and children became the ideal employees for these new underground money-making enterprises. Their bodies were smaller, enabling them to fit in the tight confines of the mine shafts, and they could be paid much less than their adult colleagues. In fact, the use of children in coal mining became so widespread that in 1851, it was estimated that children made up 30% of the coal mining workforce in Britain alone. The types of jobs the children were given were diverse, but all of them involved working in horrendous and dangerous conditions. Above ground, Breaker Boy spent 10 hours a day, 6 days per week, toiling to remove impurities from the mined coal. They would spend their day sitting on wooden chairs, hunched over conveyor belts, picking sharp pieces of slate out of the coal by hand, without the luxury of gloves. By the end of the day their fingers could often be covered in open cuts, and it was not unusual for boys to have their fingers torn off after getting them trapped in the moving conveyor belts. Many others would lose limbs, or even be crushed to death after being pulled inside the giant gears which powered the machines. Below ground, trappers were often the youngest employees, some just eight years of age. Their job was simply to open and close the trap doors, which allowed fresh air to flow through the mine, and they would often spend up to 12 hours a day, alone and in total darkness, deep within the mine. Although the work was not hard, it was mind-numbingly boring and fraught with danger. Hurriers and thrusters were older and stronger children who were given the labour-intensive job of pushing and pulling the coal-laden carts, which could easily weigh over 600 pounds through cramped roadways which were sometimes as low as 16 inches. One child would pull the cart while the other pushed, their elbows and knees scraping against the rocky surface, with the pusher often using their heads to help push against the heavy cart resulting in the hair on the child's head wearing off, leaving them bald. Hours were long for everybody, and work could often begin at 2 in the morning, with the child remaining in the mine for up to 18 hours. Such long hours in the dark could easily damage a growing child's eyesight, and the lack of ventilation in the mine caused numerous cases of respiratory disease and cancer, with many of the workers dying before the age of 25. The young workers lived with the ever-present fear of explosions and cave-ins, knowing that at any moment they could be blown to pieces or buried alive, and should they survive any of the horrific injuries that could befall them while at work, no compensation for their suffering would be forthcoming, and a future of poverty, starvation and death would likely be their fate. Number 2. Chimney Sweeps With the population of cities exploding during industrialization, the number of houses with chimneys shot up, and so did the demand for chimney sweeps. Whereas before wood was the fuel of choice for home heating, now the use of coal was on the rise. This resulted in layers of soot building up inside the flute, which would need to be frequently cleaned to stop it becoming blocked, and in many cases even catching fire, burning the house down. These new coal chimneys were far more narrow than chimneys of old, and often bent and twisted at sharp angles instead of rising straight up. It was common for them to be as narrow as 9 inches across, a space that was far too tight for an adult male to enter. As such, small children as young as four years old were recruited as apprentices and made to climb up the chimneys to dislodge the soot, usually holding a brush above his head and shimmying up the flue, using the brush to remove any loose soot and a scraper to dislodge any solid pieces. Once at the top of the chimney, he would then slide back down and collect the pile of soot, which could be sold as fertilizer. These young children would often be taken from orphanages, bought from parents or even kidnapped from the streets and would be bound to their new master as indentured servants until they were adults. The master would teach his apprentice the trade and be responsible for feeding and clothing him, yet no wages would be paid to the child, who was now totally at the mercy of their new master. While some might have been raised with care, the uncomfortable truth was that many were treated like slaves and suffered terrible abuses. The boys would sleep under soot sacks, were rarely washed, and were often deprived food to ensure that they stayed thin and therefore able to fit inside the tight spaces of the chimney. 
The chimneys they were forced to clean were often still scorching hot, and the boys' knees and elbows would be scraped bloody by the constant rubbing against the rough bricks. The master would harden their skin by making them stand close to a hot fire, and then rubbing in brine using a rough brush every evening, a process which would cause sheets of hardened skin, almost like armour, to form around the elbows and knees. The work was extremely dangerous, and boys would often get stuck inside the chimneys, becoming more tightly wedged by their panic-stricken efforts to escape, before eventually suffocating if they were not rescued in time. There were even cases where a second boy was sent up to help the trapped one, resulting in both of the boys suffocating. Stunted growth and deformity of the spine and limbs were common, due to the work forcing them to remain in twisted positions for long periods of time before their small and fragile bones had time to mature and harden. Many would go blind as a result of sores and inflammation of the eyes caused by the filthy working conditions, and asthma and even cancer were common, caused by the carcinogenic soot and constant exposure to extreme weather conditions. Even the common phrase, light a fire under you, is linked to the young chimney sweeps. If it was deemed that the boy was working too slowly, a small fire would be lit in the fireplace, the heat from which would encourage him to move faster. Another disturbing workplace motivation tactic was to send another boy up underneath and prick pins into his feet or legs to get him working more speedily. Number 1. Powder Monkeys During some of the most famous naval battles of history, hidden away from view deep within the ships engaged in battle, were dozens of small boys known as powder monkeys, whose job was vital to a ship's survival, but also highly underrated. These boys, who were often as young as nine, were given the dangerous task of ferrying gunpowder from the ship's magazine to the artillery guns. The highly explosive nature of gunpowder meant that it was secured deep within the ship in a sealed chamber known as the magazine, so as to keep it away from anything that might ignite it, which could cause a giant explosion which would destroy the entire ship. The magazine would therefore be located quite some distance away from where it was needed during the heat of battle, and as the ship's guns continued to fire, they would eventually run out of gunpowder and require a speedy resupply. Powder monkeys would make their way to the magazine as quickly as they could, bringing back a supply of gunpowder to the gun crew they were assigned to. The boys were chosen for this task primarily because of their size. Being small and quick on their feet was a huge advantage, enabling them to move faster and more easily through the tight confines of the ship's decks. In those days, the outcome of a naval battle did not only rely on the number of guns being fired at the enemy, but also on how quickly the individual guns could be reloaded and fired again. A higher rate of fire would result in the enemy ship being destroyed or disabled more rapidly, which could turn the course of a battle. The speed at which the powder monkeys moved could have a direct influence on whether or not the ship survived the battle, and even affect the outcome of the battle itself. A single delay could spell doom for a ship and her crew, lose an entire battle, and even change the course of history. An incredible responsibility was placed on the boys' shoulders, but they rarely received the recognition they deserved. Many of the boys were kidnapped, or pressed into service against their will. Their young age and tiny size made them easy targets for the press gangs. Once on board the ship, they had to quickly come to terms with the realisation that they were unlikely to ever see their homes again. With no prospect of pay, and placed at the bottom of the ship's hierarchy, life must have seemed bleak. Yet there was worse to come, as the inexperienced boys were also given one of the most dangerous jobs on board the ship. Carrying bags of gunpowder on their back during the chaos of a battle was a risky proposition. A stray spark could turn the sack of gunpowder into a deadly bomb, and the boys also had to contend with the horrors of 19th century naval combat. Bullets and cannonballs would be constantly smashing into the ship's wooden hull, spraying clouds of vicious splinters of oak in all directions. These splinters could be inches thick, and would easily shred flesh from bone and tear off limbs. The guns themselves could dismount, crushing anyone in their path under their enormous weight, or even miss fire, spraying the surrounding area with red-hot shards of iron. During the heat of battle, many of the powder monkeys would have been killed, and the sight of men suffering with horrific injuries during his journey through the ship would have been common, yet still the boy had to press on through the chaos. So those are my choices for five of the worst jobs for children in history. I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know your thoughts and what other jobs you would have included in the list in the comments below, and I'll see you again on the next video.